forward, that would be great. Um, because I think that there will be interest in um, watching after the fact for folks who weren't able to make it at the time of. Um, and I'm Amy Hoffer with Open Oregon Educational Resources. And I think what I'll do is just introduce the webinar topic and then let our presenters introduce themselves. Um, and this webinar is actually really, we're all here because I got confused this late summer, early fall, <laughs> um, because, um, you know, as um, the statewide coordinator for OER, I like to send my point people information on upcoming opportunities. Um, and there were sort of three similar um, opportunities that came up at the same time. So I thought, oh great, I'll, I'll consolidate and send people a roundup in one email. Um, folks that know me from listservs know that I send a lot of emails. So I thought I'll, I'll consolidate three into one. And then I started trying to write that email and I wasn't quite sure how to write it because, um, you know, there was one thing coming available from the Open Textbook Network, and then there was another opportunity to do this, and then I got an email from the Library Publishing Coalition, and I just thought, I don't know how to describe these to my point people or differentiate them, so um, I wrote to all three people that had sent out the information, um, and I was like, can you all make like a handout with a chart or can you do a webinar to explain the difference? Um, and I think that about brings us up to the present because here we are now. So <laughs> um, without further ado, um, let's have our three presenters um, maybe each introduce yourselves and then um, each tell us a little bit about um, what your open publishing program is and you know who you are and what you do. Um, and while they're talking, I will monitor chat, but I think we've really intended for today to be a conversation. So please do feel free to jump in on chat um, or with a microphone when we get to Q&A. Amy, you're not gonna tell which of us has to go first. All right, um, I prepared a couple slides as sort of a nerd, but um, don't worry, there's only a handful and we each are really only gonna spend about five minutes introducing our programs and then the rest of the time we'll be chatting with you. So I'm just gonna go ahead and share my slides. But... Okay, I should be in optimal presentation mode. Is that is that true? Okay, thanks for the nods. All right, hi everybody. I'm Karen Lauritsen. I'm the publishing director at the Open Textbook Network. And since we're not publishers, that's kind of a weird title. What does that mean exactly? I design learning opportunities and resources that leverage the expertise of our members who are publishing open textbooks. I also build partnerships with publishing and educational organizations to support our members' goals, and I oversee the management and development of the Open Textbook Library and the OTN website. So within the OTN, there's a dedicated publishing community that's called the Publishing Cooperative, or Co-op for short, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. However, I'm just going to give some brief background on who the OTN is as a community. As you can see here, we have around 120 members representing more than 1,100 campuses, and that is a lot of people power. It's a lot of institutional knowledge and experience, and our members have a lot of expertise that they want and do share with one another. And that really reflects our ultimate goal, which is to build capacity. No one needs to go it alone or start from scratch. I think we have that in common with LPC and Rebus. And if you're facing a problem in your open education efforts, we can look at that problem together and create a solution to share amongst ourselves. In the OTN, when people come on board and join us, we start with supporting their adoption programs. And um, that looks like support and training for running open textbook workshops. But our goal is really to support the entire open educational ecosystem which is where uh, publishing comes in and why we also offer support in that area. Our funding is through the Hewlett Foundation and other grants, 
and then our members also pay an annual community fee. So what are we about? Why are we here? Broadly, our mission is to work together to make higher education more open for a more equitable future. And we focus on textbooks as a strategy for introducing openness and OER to faculty. And using textbooks as a strategy to introduce those concepts, we're really able to increase awareness and inspire action that goes beyond the textbook. Now I know uh, textbook is obviously front and center in the name of our organization, but we really do a lot more than um, textbook adoption. It's really about open education initiatives more broadly. So that's the background on the OTN. What about the publishing co-op? What is it? So really our goal is to support members so that they can define and, and provide the appropriate publishing support they want to offer their faculty. And members of the co-op are working at the institutions you see here on the screen. And together they offer one another consultations. Um, my role is really a facilitator to connect them. Our members have created guides. I've put together a curriculum of many of the resources they've used to develop their program. I also host training opportunities. Our members can experiment in different publishing platform sandboxes. And we provide access to professional editorial services that they would not have, you know, come walking off the street with a small publishing program. And then we also work with our colleagues like the LPC and Rebus here, as well as with Scribe, who's our editorial services provider. We're also working with Coco and Editoria on an IMLS funded authoring tool. So we're really um, looking at, the, at, at publishing OER across um, a whole range of tools and systems. So for our members, there's no additional cost for joining the publishing cooperative. We do ask that they participate in Pub 101. That's an informal publishing orientation. And you can see that here in the green section of the table, some of our professional development programs. Uh, we also offer training in publishing platforms. Right now we're doing a Pressbooks training. And then in the purple part of the table, we offer community support, a dedicated Google group, a monthly hangout, which we call tea time, which is typically informal and unstructured. People can troubleshoot together. And then we offer a lot of tools and resources that our members have developed. Um, I've included their links to our um, our curriculum, which is in Canvas for open textbook publishing. I've also included a link so you can see Pub 101. Um, all of those videos are recorded. And then you can see some of the um, partner benefits like Scribe's editorial services and the Pressbooks discount. So just to quickly apply um, what these benefits might look like for somebody working at an institution. Um, this is Marjan. Her faculty are interested in writing open textbooks and she's excited, but a little tentative, a little trepidatious about what that looks like. They have an institutional repository at their institution, but she doesn't have publishing background or a lot of financial resources and she wants to help and she's not sure how. So um, Marjan could join uh, Pub 101. She could meet other people who have been in her shoes who are in her shoes right now. Um, she could offer a faculty a sandbox project in Pressbooks, and she could just find people who, um, who know what she's going through and can support her as she thinks about what publishing support might look like at her institution. So that is, in a nutshell, uh, what our publishing co-op is like at the OTN. I look forward to talking more as we move into the conversational part of our time together. Um, if you're not a member of the OTN and want to learn more about it uh, more broadly, the adoption and publishing support, I've included a link there to a form. And of course, my email, I'm based at the University of Minnesota, um, and you're welcome to contact me there. I'm happy to go next. Um, I don't have slides, so let me go ahead and I'm going to um, just paste a couple links in the chat. So if you want to peruse these while I'm talking, you can. Um, a lot of what I'm going to say is kind of replicated or represented in these pages. 
So um, first of all, can everyone hear me okay? Okay, okay. Um, so I'm Sarah Hare. I'm the Scholarly Communication Librarian at Indiana University Bloomington. And um, in my role as Scholarly Communication Librarian, I do a fair amount of publishing work. So we have a open access journal publishing program that has over 50 journals. Um, we also have an institutional repository. And then um, I would say that our uh, open educational resource outreach is very sort of developing or emerging, but I'll do consultations with folks about using press books or finding OER as well. Um, I'm talking to you all today because I'm actually on the Library Publishing Coalition's board. So the board uh, is a group of librarians from member institutions that oversee the organization's um, governance and strategic goals. So we really are in charge um, in partnership with the community facilitator of LPC um, of making really um, important decisions about how LPC operates and what its sort of uh, strategic goals are and how we implement those. I'm also currently uh, the secretary uh, for the board, so I'm kind of stepping in for Melanie today and just talking a little bit more about LPC and um, some of our work. So you'll see on that first link I sent just a little bit of background about uh, LPC or the Library Publishing Coalition. So it was basically founded by the community in partnership with Educopia in 2014. Um, we have 86 members now. Uh, we're continually growing. And uh, I think our membership represents just about every type of institution. So you'll see at the very bottom of that page, there's a list of um, some some of our, of our members, um, and there's R1s, there's liberal arts colleges, um, there's also consortiums, which is really interesting. So, uh, for example, we have the American Theological Library Association, um, there's a private academic library uh, association in Indiana that's also represented, Palney. Um, and so uh, lots of different institutions, a majority of them are in North America. So we're really looking at the sort of North American publishing context and that's what we um, sort of specialize in. Um, what's interesting about LPC that's a little bit different from other organizations is that institutions are LPC members, so uh, not individuals, uh, but individuals do a lot of the kind of work, day-to-day uh, -day work, and executing the strategic plan of the LPC. Um, and they do that through committees and task forces. So that's the second link I sent. And those are really, really important um, to kind of, again, operationalizing some of the goals of the LPC. And the, the folks that are currently involved, they have a real like sort of range of titles lots of different perspectives are presented. So everything from scholarly communication librarians like me to OER librarians, um, folks that are more specialized in digital publishing, and even university press um, folks, which uh, is really exciting that we're kind of talking through what, what does collaboration look like with our university press colleagues. Um, also have some data librarians as well. I would say that there's uh, some administrators um, represented, but most of the folks that are in the committees and task force or that are kind of the voting member of their institution are folks kind of on the ground, right, doing the day-to-day -day publishing work. And so that, I think, helps form this, this community of support. Um, I can also talk through the, the mission and more details. I don't know if we're gonna have more of a QA and a about those things, or should I, Amy, what's the best way to? I think it'd be good to talk about the um, program itself. I feel like it's so good to share this page and, you know, give people a chance to browse it. So, yeah, maybe maybe the, the program and then people can circle back in the Q&A if they have more questions. Sure, yeah. So, um, just as far as the mission of the LPC and then I'll, I'll give a couple examples of things that we actually do that are related to um, library publishing and um, kind of what that looks like in practice. So you can see on that page that essentially um, what we're trying to do is extend the impact and sustainability of library publishing and open scholarship by having this kind of professional forum um, for A, developing best practices, and then B, um, developing shared expertise. So part of the, the kind of goal of the community is just naming those best practices, right? Talking to your colleagues about them, um, being able to develop expertise in those areas, and really, I think, taking this community-based approach, um, which is the whole topic of this call, uh, that we can do more together than a single publishing program can do alone. So that's that's the like higher level mission. Um, but what does that actually look like in practice, or what you know what do we do? Um, so a couple examples. One thing that I think uh, is really important, and then talking to Melanie about this, um, I think was even more important historically, 
is we provide a professional identity for library publishers. So this is, I think, a fairly new area of librarianship or LIS. Um, and so the LPC is kind of a place to point to to say, this is a legitimate part of the profession. These are my colleagues. These are my peers. This is how I can benchmark. So just being able to say that institutionally when you're talking to administrators or other um, folks within your institution. Uh, a couple more examples, we developed an ethical framework in 2017 that sort of acts like um, guidelines for library publishers with these really big, uh, tough ethical issues. So things like analytics, right, or accessibility, um, thinking about how we make the publishing process more diverse and equitable, how do we publish more diverse content, right? Um, so it, it kind of acts as a set of best practices that library publishers can then consult. And again, it was created by the community for the community. Um, a couple other things, we uh, continually lift up new research in library publishing. We have um, on that committee and task force list, you'll see there's a research committee. Um, and so something that they do is um, have an award yearly uh, that kind of lifts up library uh, publishing research. So again, to kind of name those best practices. Um, we're also, we have a sort of listing of current library publishing um, research that other people can use to kind of jumpstart their literature review, for example, um, that can be really useful to the community. Um, and then the other thing I mentioned is just education. So uh, it's, it's fairly new, but there um, is a library publishing curriculum. We recently hired um, a sort of uh, editor for the library publishing curriculum, and I believe uh, next year there will be kind of an editorial board for that library publishing curriculum. Um, so the idea is that folks that are new to this area uh, can go and attend um, pieces of the curriculum and learn more um, and feel like they, uh, you know, have some expertise and competence in those in those areas if they're starting a library publishing um, program. Uh, we also, one of our committees is cons uh, constructing competencies uh, related to library publishing. So, you know, as we talk about a lot, um, you know, our LIS schools really addressing this new area of librarianship? Um, is it built into their curriculum? And so developing a set of competencies might help um, in uh, developing uh, more course materials or um, uh, just, you know, courses, curriculum, general resources for LIS students that are really interested in this area as uh, an area that they might uh, kind of practice professionally or be interested in uh, for the job search. And yeah, I would just say um, the last thing is the library publishing forum. So uh, that's every spring, uh, usually in May. So uh, this May will be near Boston. And that's literally <laughs> an in-person forum for talking about these things. Um, so a really exciting kind of in-person meeting uh, to just get together with your colleagues and learn about what they're doing and how you can um, better your practice. It's also open to non-members. So we welcome folks that aren't LPC members. Um, you can still attend and we hope that you do just to kind of get an idea of uh, what the LPC is and uh, some of the conversations we're having. Thing. So I'll, I'll stop there. So I have other items for the um, for the more kind of conversational piece we'll have, but I'm happy to answer any questions later on. Well, hi there. Um, so I'm here to talk about Rebus Foundation. My name is Lee Kinch Pedrosa, and I am the uh, communications. I handle communications and partnerships for the Rebus Foundation. I'm stepping in for Zoe Wake Hyde, who is our associate director and not feeling 100%. So I'm here to, to talk about all the fun things that we're doing. Um, here are a bunch of links. The first one is rebus.community, which takes you to our main homepage. The second one is the uh, drive, which takes you to a document that explains textbook success program, which is the big program I'm here to talk about today. And the third is the link to how you would request a consultation to talk about if this is right for you um, with somebody on our team. So a little about the Rebus Foundation. We are a Canadian registered charity and we are um, located in Montreal, Quebec. Um, Rebus Community is sort of a uh, initiative of the Rebus Foundation and we are funded by the Hewlett Foundation. Yay, Hewlett, Hewlett Buddies. <laughs> um, a little bit more on that. So the Rebus Community is dedicated to open textbook creation and really supporting faculty, uh, librarians, uh, program administrators, even students who are interested in collaborating and working in a collaborative publishing model towards creating open textbooks. Um, we offer a suite of tools and resources that support that. And there are three main big ones. The first one is the software that we've created 
if you go to rebus.community, you can click create a project and in a few, you know, fill out a little form real quick and create a project homepage for an open textbook in development or one that you're still looking for adoptions and so on and so forth. So it's, it's a pretty handy tool. Um, we've also got the Rebus Guide to Publishing Open Textbooks so far. And the reason why we call it so far is because we want to be continually adding to it to um, flesh out what is the collaborative publishing model for creators or people who want to do it uh, with a group, maybe on their own. Uh, some of the new places we're trying to expand into is uh, how do you build student impact assessment into creation of your textbooks? How do you take into consideration uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion as you create your textbooks? How do you incorporate that early on? And um, adaptations as well, and beyond that, uh, things like localizations, translations. So this is the future for us right now. The open text, the, uh, the Rebus Guide to Publishing Open Textbooks covers everything from building a team to creating content, peer review, a uh, big chapter on accessibility, um, post-release adoptions, marketing and communication. So it's a pretty handy open book if you're ever, if you're ever interested in it. If you were at OpenEd, we had a whole bunch of print copies that were pretty neat. Um, finally, there's the textbook success program, which is the thing I am most excited to talk about today. Um, in the textbook success program, we group together a uh, 10, pro or 10 project teams from varying institutions. Yay, Amy has a copy. <laughs> um, yeah, so we group together 10, um, 10 project teams from varying institutions. Those 10 teams go together uh, online for 12 weekly courses that cover the publishing process, um, kind of from start to finish, but we do understand that people need to move around and iterate and, and adapt it for their own their own processes and after the 12 weeks we do nine months of weekly check-ins with this cohort of creators and um, the reason why we group people together like this is we really value cross-institutional bonds and um, right now our current cohort which started in October is just rounding out its 12 weeks and included courses from uh, uh, <laughs> included um, project teams from SUNY, from Virginia Tech, from Canley, which is the Canadian Legal Information Institute in Canada, and uh, Concordia University here in Montreal. So together, they all work together, they share their experiences, they tackle, uh, they tackle those troubles, um, and it's all facilitated by my, co my colleague, uh, Aparva Ashok. Um, the way that we got to this model, I think is really cool and very interesting. The story begins uh, about four years ago, when we started working with pilot projects to support their needs on the project management level, but also on a bunch of different ways um, to create open textbooks. From that, we learned as a group um, some, some best practices, some guidance, and things that we think that we can share um, throughout this. All of that is documented in the Rebus Guide to um, Publishing Open Textbooks, um, but the Textbook Success Program sort of offers an in-depth tool to get through it all together and that is a paid service and um, sometimes we offer subsidized uh, spots but it is a paid service uh, all resources which i think is very cool all the resources that we do use in it are still openly available as well um, hmm. so yes back to those links there's the rebus guide to publish uh, rebus doc community there's the uh, longer doc which has a whole bunch of information about what we cover including a brief uh, a brief description of each class in it if you really want to know what like the meat of the program is and then finally again there's a um, there's a form if you want to uh, request a consultation I'll also just put my email in there well as well because I love talking about stuff and it can walk forever um, can't type when I need to okay <laughs> and uh, I'll leave it at that and Thank you for giving me the opportunity to come in and talk about this. I'm really excited to hear about questions. So thank you, Karen, Sarah, and Lee. And um, <clears throat> I'm going to do a very librarian move right now and ask a really nuts and bolts kind of question of all three of you. And if we could just go back through. So um, how do people sign up? Are there any upcoming deadlines that they should know about? Are there memberships that they have to join before they can sign up are there costs associated let's do the nitty-gritty because i'm sure that other people are also wondering
I'll jump in. Um, so for the Rebus Textbook Success Program, if you're interested in joining that, um, our next cohort, we still have one or two spots, starts in February, so it's pretty tight. Uh, but you can talk to me anytime, and I'm happy to, to sit down and, and go through those conversations. The cost for that is $3,500 per project. That includes the year-long thing. There's also a bunch of other smaller stuff that it includes, it's, uh, premium support and things like that. Um, if you have three projects, it goes down to $3,000 per project. Um, you can sign up pretty quickly. There's a contract that we'll go through together and I walk you every step of the way. The next cohort starts in May. Um, you can talk to me about that as well and I'm happy to do that. And then we also have cohorts starting for September. So it, it depends on when you are ready and we are we're pretty ac accessible to, to talk to you about those things. Um, with regards to using the software, it's free. With regards to using the Rebus Guide to Publishing Open Textbooks, it's online. You can get it anywhere. I can go really quickly. Um, so I'll just do another link uh, to bombard you all with links. Uh, essentially, uh, it's very simple. It's, uh, again, organizations join. So it's $2,000 um, US dollars to join the Library Publishing Coalition. The link that I just sent gives a little bit uh, more information about what we'll ask. Um, I think it's like a maybe a one page. Uh, yeah, membership application. So really straightforward, just about how you think your organization would benefit from being a member of the LPC. Um, we do, I think our memberships are uh, July through June, so the like fiscal year. So uh, if you wanted to time it based on that, you'd get the most out of your $2,000. I believe we don't prorate. Um, but yeah, those are the most essential details. And Sarah, um, before we go on to Karen, um, the curriculum that you mentioned, is that like a cohort based model or do people just get self guided or how does that work? So I believe that all of the curriculum is openly licensed and I can take a look while Karen's um, talking as well. I believe all of it's openly licensed folks actually instructing it that are members of the LPC um, for a while people were going to, you know, ECRL or other professional development um, opportunities, LPF it's, itself uh, to kind of give the curriculum. And so that would be part of that registration. Um, but let me let me um, double check and I'll send, send a URL. It's a good question. So um, to that question about curriculum, we've definitely incorporated parts of it into the open textbook publishing curriculum. So it is openly licensed um, and a great resource. And all of our resources um, are published CC BY, so they're available to the broader community. If people want to join the Open Textbook Network, um, my colleague Sarah Cohen manages the membership onboarding process. I put a link in the chat with more information about what membership includes, particularly in the first year. There's a very structured program. And then once you're part of the OTN, uh, you can join the publishing co-op. We do have Pub 101 coming up in the spring, and I will be um, sending an invitation shortly uh, with those details. It'll start in April. Uh, but we do record those sessions, and so everybody can participate in Pub 101 uh, asynchronously. So I'll drop that link in the chat as well. Uh, Amy, did I cover everything there? So do people need to be Open Textbook Network members in order to join Pub 101? Yes. Okay. That is the case right now. Mm -hmm. okay. So um, let's open it up for questions and let's just kind of start with details. Do people need any clarification on what we've talked about so far, like especially logistics, like let's kind of get that out of the way and then turn to broader questions. So um, there's a question in the chat are consortial members of OTN also able to join Pub 101? Thanks, Darren. Absolutely. So uh, consortial leads are invited to extend that invitation to all of their institutional members. And we did the first Pub 101 in the fall, and that was a big chunk of our participants. So um, you're very welcome to extend a Pub 101 invitation. I know a couple of Oregonians have gotten a lot out of it. Any other questions about logistics? This is exactly what I was like trying to send a roundup email to my point people and I was like, I'm stuck. I don't know how to tell people what the difference is between all of these opportunities. So um, I'm just really glad to have the explainer. 
Um, Karen Bjork says, it's great and I love it. <laughs> Josie says, Lee, how long has Rebus been running the textbook success program? So this is actually our first cohort started in October of 2019. Um, they just finished up the 12 week portion of their course. Um, so yeah, since October, um, and we're really excited about it. Um, before that, we had a series of beta projects, which um, I hate the term beta, but you know, like, like uh, preliminary projects that we learned from. Um, and they were doing something very, very similar to this, but less uh, structured as, as So I'm leaving a pause to see if people want to put in more questions, but I think that our silence is indicating that the explanations have been successful and people are understanding what is on offer, um, which is great. And so let's just open it up for any kind of question for um, Karen, Sarah, or Lee about their organizations or their programs or about open publishing in general. Um, I'll just pause for a second and see if anyone wants to ask a question in the chat or turn on your microphone. Okay, I have a question, but um, I, we didn't prep this, and so I don't mean to stump the presenters, but I was just hoping that you'd be able to share like a favorite story about um, something that came out of one of these training programs that you offer, um, like a, a success story or like a favorite interaction that happened um, as a result of the programs that you offer. Like I said, I didn't warn them that I would be asking this question. <laughs> I'll jump in. Okay. Um, so it's a really, really small thing, but it's just a really cool example of like a community coming together, troubleshooting a, a problem um, or a question, a conundrum. Uh, we have a project right now um, who is working on, who um, uh, they're using math symbols and logic symbols. Um, which can be a big tough issue when you're thinking about formatting and trying to do things accessible accessibly and um, We were able to uh, Take advantage of the really great minds that were in the room to sort of tackle it together um, And then we just started after that was done. We didn't feel like we were quite finished with those answers So we went out and just started crowdsourcing um, crowdsourcing uh, questions about it, like do we want to use MathML, do you want to use LaTeX, how do you do it, what is an SVG, I don't even know, but like all of these acronyms together um, using Twitter, which I'm a huge fan of, using our newsletter and using um, the TSP together to source like a really robust and usable answer in the room. So um, for me, what I love about that is just seeing not just like what, um, you know, our facilitator can do in that moment, which is wonderful, but also what the other people in the uh, in the co or the cohort can do for each other, and then also just pulling it out to the whole world of Twitter and seeing what, what happens there. So, I like that. Thanks, Lee, Karen, or Sarah. Do you want to jump in? So I think uh, you know my my short answer is the same as Lee. Seeing the community come together and and figure things out is very rewarding. Um, and the story that I'll share is actually from the Library Publishing Forum last year because we partnered on an OER pre-conference workshop and uh, members of the OTN were all in the room. I think there were six or seven of them and they really facilitated a room full of colleagues in defining their OER program, figuring out when to use an MOU, what to look for in an MOU, how to have conversations about licenses, thinking about whether or not you are in a position to provide proofreading or editorial services. 
um, but really seeing the OTN members shine as leaders and share that information with our colleagues uh, is really, was, it was a great experience. I'm not sure I have a specific answer for you. I'm sorry. Um, I, I would just say generally to echo the things already said, right? Um, folks sending messages across the listserv and feeling like they get, you know, um, some detailed answers, some more information, somewhere to start. Um, I would also say some of the shared webinars we've done, um, particularly around specific tools have been really helpful. Um, so, it, you know, you kind of get to see uh, other folks within the profession that are using that tool and um, talk to them more about how you could better use it, so. So it sounds like you're all saying really strongly that um, the community piece of it is the most important, which is really nice to hear. Um, really good question from Darren in the chat and I'll read it out. <clears throat> sounds like all of you have some overlap in terms of the professional development opportunities if I'm new to library publishing and I have limited time and resources, what do you think would help me most to decide where to go first? That's a toughie because we all want to say us. <laughs> But uh, what I would say, like for my part, um, I'm happy to talk about your institution anytime you want. Just email me or fill out our consultation form. The other thing I would suggest if you're, if you're brand new to it is um, coming to Office Hours. Office Hours is a program that we run or we co-host with our really good friends at the Open Textbook Network. And we talk about all sorts of different um, issues, some practical, some philosophical, and it's just a really great community meeting ground, I find. So if you're if you're interested in just dipping your toe in the water, I recommend Office Hours. It's a, it's a great place. Next one is next week, and it's on peer review. So. <laughs> Darren, uh, some of that may depend on whether you're focused on OER or broader library publishing efforts. Um, you know, Rebus and OTN are very OER focused and Library Publishing Coalition is more broadly focused. Um, I think starting with case studies is always a fun read, trying to find institutions that may be most like yours and just reading about what they've developed. And I know um, in the authoring guides that OTN has produced and Rebus has produced, there are case studies in there that you might um, glean some sort of first steps from. Of course, if you're already a member of the OTN or LPC, um, that might be a good place to start. You've already sort of um, paid, paid your dues, literally and figuratively. Um, but really thinking about uh, what kind of publishing program you want to provide could also be a good first step. Uh, if you're more sort of on the DIY side of the spectrum, you might not have a lot of time or resources, but you wanna do something to support your faculty and students maybe giving them a publishing platform and a guide, um, you know, that might point to one particular community. If you're thinking um, that you might want to build a publishing program with an imprint, an identity, that might point to some, some different resources. Um, but I think all of us offer uh, support for kind of everything in between. So it is a good question. I'll just echo that and say, yeah, I think it depends on how specific uh, you want to get and if there's a, some sort of specialization. Um, I think for general um, library publishing, the LPC has a lot to offer. And I'll say even, you know, if you're not a member right now, um, we have a couple resources that are freely available online. So I already talked about the curriculum and sent the link out. We also have the library publishing directory, which um, annually folks fill it out uh, and talk a little bit about things that they're doing, what they specialize in, how many journals they have, what tools they're using, they're specializing in OER. Um, so you could search that and find peers. Um, they're doing this work and kind of talk to them informally as even a starting point. Um, and then also the forum, which again is, is open to folks that um, even aren't LPC members. So might be a couple of leads there. Thank you. Those are three really helpful answers. And Sarah, what you're saying resonates with me because when I was like, should Open Oregon get a Pressbooks account? Like, what would it mean if we were publishing things? I actually just went to um, University of the Pacific and sat down with Isaac Gilman for like an hour and um, 
you know, but then, I mean, the issue is that I'm an experiential learner, so I just have to try things <laughs> and then, and then you're accidentally a publisher. Um, so, um, Lee, question for you. Have you shared out what you discovered about publishing accessible math equations? That would be another really good link to put in the chat. Don't have it ready yet. I have a blog post draft that I plan to, uh, that I plan to publish really soon. This is a recent story, but we'll definitely have it out soon. It's going to highlight some of the uh, helpful tips some of the conundrums yet unsolved and share the resources that we that we were able to gather so great so we will watch that space um, <laughs> stephanie says the university i am at has been providing education about oer resulting in some faculty interest and use this spring the provost has asked me and a colleague to develop a university-wide oer proposal yay do you have recommendations on how to create a campus-wide program or resources to consider such a good question. And I responded, Stephanie, in the chat. I think this is actually a really good um, sort of community coming together question because I see people in this call who have a lot of experience doing just that and they might be able to share their particular um, action plan or campus wide recommendations. Um, so I invite everyone here to share links uh, with Stephanie. I'll also try and track some down, but this is a very common, you know, uh, first step in developing an open educational program. And so it is something that we spend a lot of time on when people join the OTN. And it's also something that my colleague Tanya Gross spends time on. We have an OER certificate program uh, for librarians. And through the course of the program, they develop exactly what you're describing an action plan for their campus. has nothing to do with LPC, but I think <laughs> be remiss, right, if we didn't talk about other community organizations that do this work. So Spark, um, the Scholarly Publishing and Research Coalition group um, is, you know, has lots of resources, I think, that would help with this. So things I would do if I were in your position is look at their listserv. You can often search by key term, keywords and the listserv is completely open to anyone. And so that question has probably come up multiple times, like, has someone made a proposal for their provost? And um, folks will even share drafts. And then their OER Connect report um, often will be very similar to the directory I was just talking about, um, a lead where you can go and see, okay, um, who else has this specific type of program that I'm really interested in? I'm interested in an OER review program. You can see, or I'm interested in soft funding. You can limit by that and then find peers to chat with. So um, I think there's so many, and we're really lucky, so many different um, kind of community organizations that are here to help us. Yeah, I'll also say um, if you're a little further on and you're looking to build something that includes the professional development side of things, um, this is a link. It's uh, CC BY, so y'all can have a look at it. It's what uh, Idaho State Board of Education is doing to situate or to call for proposals for their programs. Um, and it's got an interesting, so a lot of really good uh, language in it if you're, if you're looking for professional development uh, on campus and want to source uh, participants in it. So that's a little bit further along. I'd also echo um, that getting on those listservs, uh, Spark OER is really great. CCC OER is awesome. Um, what's the other one we do? Uh, CC Open, uh, CC Open Edu is the other, uh, the other forum that I'm, or listserv that I, I love, yeah. And the Open Textbook Network has a listserv. Oh, yes, that one too. Shoot. That one too. <laughs> I think those are the four main ones that I follow. Um, so we do have time for um, more Q&A, but while we're sort of on this topic, I wanted to ask another question that we're kind of um, approaching already anyway, but just to sort of make it more explicit um, about how we can work together across these organizations. Karen mentioned a couple of good examples of the Open Textbook Network having partnerships with both Rebus and the Library Publishing Coalition. And I'm curious, you know, since we do have common goals, um, are there other ideas in the works? Do folks want to put into the chat, you know, what, what you'd like to see for partnerships? Um, just wanted to open that up. So we're always talking with Rebus about ways uh, we might be able to work together in the future. Uh, we really 
appreciate their, um, their tools and platforms and the way that they bring different potential collaborators together. And that's something that's on our mind um, for the next iteration of the Open Textbook Library, thinking about how to connect faculty who shared reviews in the library, thinking about um, collaborations on peer review and new editions, for example. And then um, I think I briefly mentioned, we are also starting a collaboration with COCO and Editoria. Um, that's an IMLS funded grant program. They um, have a publishing um, platform that's called Editoria, and we're working with them really on the early stages of textbook development. So um, textbooks are you know, very different than monographs. They um, have a particular structure in each chapter that's probably gonna be uh, consistent for the student learning experience. And so we're really thinking about ways to help librarians and authors and other project managers work together early on um, in thinking about, you know, how is this textbook going to work? How is it going to read? You know, what kind of interactivity do I want? Um, so that's a partnership we just got off the ground in December, and we expect to have our first prototype for this tool um, any day now or in the next few weeks. And we have an advisory group from across the OTN who is guiding the development of that tool. Yeah, I'll just echo what Karen says. We do. Uh, we have right now the office hours, which we've been. You know what I said? There's been three January ones, so I think we're rounding in the third year of office hours that we've been doing with with OTN, and it's been a real pleasure um, working alongside OTN on that. And I'm excited to see like what our future holds together. And I think everyone's super open, um, as well as LPF. Like it's been our long time, or LPC. It's been a, a long time understanding in our office that like librarians are amazing, and we need to talk to them all the time because they're the people on the grounds. And oftentimes, we we often talk about you know the lone librarian lifting the OER program up on campus, and that is so important to us to listen and to support. Like, what do you got to? What do you need from us? to support that that behemoth effort and so i'm i'm i would love to talk further with with the good folks of lpf or lpc and and your whole network and dive into what we could do for librarians yeah i, I think this has already been mentioned but um some of the things we're already doing uh, karen um, represented really well right the um pre-conference and working with um, OTN, um, also shared webinars or shared spaces, you know, virtually that are more accessible than maybe an in-person meeting where we can have conversations about the work we're doing and how we can support each other. Um, this is maybe high level, but I think something that's really important um, and something I've talked to Zoe about because I've used Rebus for another uh, project is how we communicate the value of community, um, particularly to administrators or to folks that maybe only see us as serving our constituents, right? I'm here to serve Indiana University. Um, what can I do for my, um, uh, my faculty and my students? And I think that's really important, but also thinking about um, how we work together as lar larger organizations um, beyond individual institutions or beyond individual constituents um, to have this kind of larger ethos of we can do more as a community than we can do as a single um, program. So I think just continually, like calls like this, continually communicating that and supporting each other in that work is important. Um, Justin says in the chat that um, they just got funding to join both Spark and OTN. I'm hoping we can also get into LPC at some point. I'm pointing a lot of faculty towards Rebus now who want to do peer review on possible books. And I'm so glad that you're doing that because I've started pointing um, Oregon's OER grantees to Rebus if they want peer review. And so <laughs> we need reviewers. Um, so I'm just really happy to see that like both sides of the community need are being met in that way. Um, so thanks for doing that. Um, and I can see that people are starting to filter away because we're rounding the bend on the hour. Um, so I just wanted to say um, that this is, um, you know, a collaborative webinar and um, 
I'm sort of just the facilitator, but um, it also sort of counted as the first winter webinar um, in Open Oregon's winter webinar series because it's such a crummy time of year to try to travel. So we're doing online professional development. So um, I'm just going to put a link to the calendar. We've got a couple of upcoming presenters actually here right now, which is really cool, um, as well as former presenters. But um, I can see that Lauren Ray is here and she's going to um, be doing a webinar in March about finding and showcasing open resources by subject. And Cheryl is also going to do an Open Ed Week kickoff webinar on getting started, which is going to be a really good one to share with faculty who feel like, I'm a beginner. What are you all talking about? <laughs> How do I jump in? Um, so um, thanks, Lauren and Cheryl. Um, and nice to see you here. Um, and let's see, there's more happening in the chat here. Oh, yeah. So um, the next Office Hours, which is a Rebus and Open Textbook Network um, regular webinar series. Um, and this chat is just like a wealth of links at this point. Um, maybe we need to capture that and send it out in some way before it all just vanishes. Um, do we have any final questions for the panelists? Okay, that's me counting to 10 really slowly. So <laughs> I'm gonna take that as a no final questions. Thank you all three of you so much for doing this. This is just incredibly helpful to understand the different options and differentiate them and sort of understand like where to point people to. Um, so thank you so much for talking about what you do and thank you also for doing what you do. Like what a great service for this community to have these organizations. Thanks, Amy, for coordinating and facilitating. Yes, thanks everybody. Thanks, Amy. See you soon. <laughs>